All right. Thank you all for coming at lunchtime. Um, thanks to my wonderful lab mates, there is pizza um, and Capri Suns and chips. Um, so it's you know lunch of champions. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all um, in a different room, similar audience, um, uh, for my first seminar here at Moss Landing. I'm a postdoc. I started in August, and I work under Scott Hamilton on the uh, California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program, CCFRP. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that project, I encourage you to go to the website, ccfrp.org. Um, but today I'm not going to be talking about that at all. I'm going to be talking about some of my previous research and uh, sort of um, giving a sneak peek to uh, future research. Um, a little bit of background on, on myself. Um, I am from California. I did my undergrad at UCSB uh, in aquatic biology. I did my master's and PhD at Florida State University in biological sciences. Uh, in between those two periods, I spent uh, close to a decade being a technician on various projects, um, and I'm still loving the game. So, um, the title of my talk is Ecophysiology of Ecosystem Engineers Bioenergetic Effects of Climate and Food on Dominant Consumers and Their Consequences for Coastal Ecosystems. It's a mouthful. So, if you focus on these two key words, uh, I think it'll, you'll be well served. I'm going to be focusing on climate and food in kind of two sections of this talk. Before I do that, I want to do some thank yous up front. Um, the biggest thank you that I have to make is to my family, who happened to be in the audience for once. Um, which uh, None of this science would be possible even remotely without their support. Um, I want to thank my advisor for my PhD, Dr. Dan Okamoto, um, who's an amazing mentor. He's a mensch, which is, if you're not aware is Yiddish for someone of high integrity and respect. And he's a BAMF. Um, this is a man that submitted an NSF grant from his hospital deathbed um, after his appendix burst. Um, and he's just a wonderful human being. Um, and if you haven't met him, you should. I want to thank my committee members at large, um, Dr. Aaron Galloway and Dr. Lynn Lee, who are amazing ecologists in their own right. I want to thank all my lab mates um, who've shared wonderful experiences with me. I want to thank my funders for all the research I'm going to talk about. I um, want to thank um, the indigenous people of British Columbia um, who invited me into their territory and helped out as collaborators uh, in some of this research as well. All right. Um, without further ado, I'll get into the science. So again, the first part is going to be talking about food. Um, and I'm going to discuss uh, some uh, insights that I've learned from uh, two studies. Um, these are manuscripts in late stages of uh, preparation. The first will be uh, consumer resilience and how it suppresses the recovery of overgrazed ecosystems. And the second will be uh, biomarkers of recovery. And the second part of the talk is going to be focused on climatic drivers, um, and how contemporary ocean acidification and marine heat waves shape the energetics and rates of herbivory in a dominant ecosystem engineer. So on the subject of food, there's been almost 100 years of ecology focused on how food abundance um, really drives ecological interactions and community structure. Um, I really love this figure from 1942. Um, after Lindman's paper um, that illustrates some of the trophic dynamics as it was understood at the time where you have solar radiation entering a complex web of pond weeds and phytoplankters and benthic predators and everything is ultimately connected to the ooze, um, uh, which, which whatever that is, but food is important in it. Um, and variation in food availability is among the strongest drivers uh, affecting the fitness of heterotrophs, whether it's um, the timing and decision of smolting in brown trout, uh, recruitment in black surf perch, uh, clutch overlap in heterandria, which is a live-bearing uh, guppy, uh, or um, stock recruitment dynamics in Pacific cod. It also influences the reproductive potential of voles in Europe, 
Um, it's impacted wildebeest populations over 40 years. It influences mammal uh, fitness in Antarctica as a function of the availability of krill, which also affects the population dynamics of seabirds as well as passerine birds. Um, but the system I want to focus on today is um, a, a kind of two different phases of the same uh, sp spaces, um, which are kelp forests and sea urchin barrens. So primary productivity in kelp forests uh, is, is tremendous. And it's been noted for many years that it rivals tropical rainforests uh, in terms of productivity. And it's also a highly uh, diverse system. And uh, conversely, sea urchin barrens uh, which, are, uh, which have notably proliferated mainly in the north coast of California, um, uh, represent relatively a collapsed kelp forest ecosystem. And the processes driving this, um, uh, to a certain extent, have, have been well explained already. Um, we know that um, the influence of keystone predators like sea otters have indirect positive effects on, um, on primary productivity by indirect effects on uh, predate, predating on sea urchin herbivores. Uh, and similarly, these mesopredators, um, sunflower stars, or pycnopodia, uh, also serve a key role that's uh, more or less uh, uh, synonymous. Um, but both predators are now largely absent to the system throughout their range, uh, one because of uh, overhunting and the other because of uh, wasting disease. Um, so this plot is from uh, a few years ago now, uh, and it illustrates the distribution of barrens uh, observed throughout the world. Everywhere you see a green border, that's where there's been an observed uh, abundance of kelp. And everywhere that there's a lavender uh, or pink dot represents uh, an observation of a barren state. There are different shades of pink and purple, and they represent different dynamics of transition between kelp forests and barrens and back again in some cases. Um, and one of the questions that um, really interested me was um, how do sea urchins that are largely responsible for creating these ecosystem states, how do they persist and cope with nutritional stress, i.e. starvation, in food to pauper barrens? You know, so when you look at a barren, it looks like a barren moonscape. There's no, you know, conspicuous food available and, and you need food to survive. How are they surviving sometimes decades uh, in these environments? One mechanism is through subsidies. Um, so uh, some species of urchins are really good at catching drift algae from uh, exogenous locations. Um, they also trap other subsidies like salps. Uh, they can eat alternative food resources like encrusting uh, biofilms and encrusting algae. Um, and then um, they can even uh, probably eat little tiny tube worms that are, that are actually really abundant in uh, sea urchin barrens. Um, and then there's this other category uh, of subsidy. I, I, additionally, um, sea urchins are, are quite often uh, regarded as mainly herbivores, but they do basically eat anything they encounter, in my experience. Um, we have an octopus on the left. Um, and a uh, rockfish towards the right, a jelly on the far right. I've seen them eating um, bat rays. Uh, I've seen them eating sheep crabs. I've seen them eating plastic bags, each other. Um, they'll eat just about anything. Um, another method is through foraging, so taking risks and seeking out food by detecting it uh, far away and exposing themselves to predation and other stressors uh, by active foraging. Um, another is through plasticity in their physiology. Um, uh, so one way that's been shown is actual shrinking of the body. Um, so this is a study uh, from 1989 from Don Levitan in the tropics looking at uh, diadema. And what's really cool here is that um, these are uh, time series plots on the left. Um, in A, you have um, uh, differences in density denoted by black and uh, open white symbols. And what you see is that if over time, um, if the density of urchins is high, their uh, overall body size will shrink because of uh, a reduction in per capita food availability over time. 
Um, and similarly, their overall biomass will actually shrink. So you're talking about a sea urchin body that is literally shrinking uh, as a function of starvation, which has ob been observed in other animals as well. Um, however, uh, applying that insight to a temperate system is perhaps um, uh, not uh, as straightforward. So there's this paper that came out um, uh, uh, about shrinking sea urchins and the problems of measurement. Um, so these are a lot, uh, anything below the zero line on this plot represents shrinkage of the body. Um, but if you account for measurement error uh, in that, you see that most of those results that are reported as shrinkage uh, disappear and you're actually at a net zero uh, delta change in diameter. So probably there's something else going on in temperate urchins. Um, one way is that they can mobilize reversible energy reserves. So in sea urchins, um, they have large, large gonads that occupy most of their body cavity, and they serve as both reproductive organs and energy storage organs, and they can shrink and grow as a function of food availability. Um, but there's this interesting other mechanism uh, that I looked into, which was whether they could, and to what degree they could down-regulate their metabolic rate um, at a cellular level. And um, we published a paper in 2021 demonstrating both that um, uh, in the wild, in barons, you have 45% lower uh, gonads, uh, body size specific gonad mass on average in barons. Um, and then also 50% um, uh, roughly lower metabolic rate um, on a per unit biomass basis. Um, so this, uh, this metabolic rate, which on the y-axis, that um, VO2 is just represents volumetric oxygen uh, change over time. And total ash-free dry mass is just a way of measuring biomass without accounting for things like skeletal mass that likely doesn't contribute to respiration very much. So um, this finding turned out to be pretty robust throughout different field sites um, throughout British Columbia. Uh, you see the same pattern emerge. Um, and so this is pretty cool. Um, if you take a, a, a step back and look at the broader context of the literature and you think about metabolic theory of ecology, for example, um, it's been noted that there's this really cool relationship between uh, body size and uh, metabolic rate. Um, and this, this relationship is pretty consistent across a huge range of diversity of organisms, anywhere from fish to unicellular animals to plants. This consistent scaling relationship uh, uh, emerges. But I want to emphasize that this is at a macro scale and you're talking about log scale relationships, which obscure a lot of the details. And the devil is in the details, really. So, for example, um, this really cool study came, came out uh, by Ruiz et al. in 2021, demonstrating that there was as much as a 180% difference in the resting metabolic rate uh, as a function of food quality. And that's the, body, that's the body size specific metabolic rate. So what you're looking at on this plot, um, on the x-axis is body size, um, and on the y-axis is re metabolic rate. Uh, and so the different colors represent different diets. And uh, I wanna highlight that up here, you're talking about a relatively poor quality, if you will, diet. And down uh, at the bottom, you have a relatively good quality diet. Um, and so that's a huge effect. Um, that's uh, in the paper, the authors note that it's uh, kind of uh, equivalent to the difference between uh, you know, a mouse metabolism and an elephant in terms of the relative difference in that dynamic. So that has big implications for uh, the assumption that these scaling relationships with metabolism are fixed rather than food dependent. So um, building on those uh, observations in the field that I mentioned before, um, I had some new questions. You know, is this dynamic reversible? If so, how, what's the time scale? How long does it take to transition between these metabolic states? Um, how do these metabolic states affect 
um, the rates of herbivory, the rates of per capita consumption, how efficient it is uh, in terms of growing new body mass. Can we, um, after the fact, go back and um, hindcast their uh, diet uh, in the habitat that they actually lived in? Um, and then, you know, it begs the question, how does food composition or quality affect um, herbivore performance uh, across a range of responses? And so to address these questions, I ran uh, a lab experiment where I was moving at near light speed the entire time and uh, applied this uh, experimental design where I took um, sea urchins from kelp forests and and barrens, and these were very close together in space, separated by no more than uh, uh, 25 meters. And um, I either fed them uh, kelp-only diet, a mixed salad diet, if you will, or a, which would be a low and high quality diet, respectively, or they were starved. And this was um, a fully crossed factorial design, and it ran for uh, a month. And I measured a whole lot of um, stuff, uh, including both energetic responses and uh, fatty acid diet tracer assimilation. I'm going to talk about the fatty acid bit uh, uh, in a minute. Um, just leave that aside for the moment. I'll focus on the energetics first. Um, all of those responses represent components of the, uh, the energy budget of an animal. An animal only has so much energy to expend. Um, and it's one of the few constraints we can apply to uh, individual biology. And uh, some of these are those key rates of met metabolic rate, energy allocation, feeding rate, and efficiency. Um, so this is what I found. Um, after, so I, I want to orient you to this plot first. Um, you have uh, on the uh, x-axis you have the beginning of the experiment, day zero, on the, uh, at the end of the experiment, day 33. And what this is showing is metabolic rate um, that has been, uh, that is in per units of ash-free dry mass. Again, that's that sort of uh, metabolically active biomass. And each of the points um, represents, uh, the color of the points represents the diet, treatment, and the shape of those points represents the origin that the animal came from. And what's really neat is you get this kind of reciprocal response, where you transition between one of two states uh, of resting metabolism, either one that's um, synonymous with a kelp forest, where it's relatively high or normal metabolic rate, if you will, uh, or this kind of depressed state, um, where it's uh, kind of like zombie urchins, where you, are, uh, ver you have a very low resting metabolism and you're uh, very uh, much more able to kind of conserve uh, energy through a, a reduced metabolic rate. Um, and so this is pretty rapid uh, as well. So this is only 33 days, um, and you get this uh, almost uh, binary transition between uh, the profiles of the two habitats. Uh, so implications of this is, could be that this mechanism facilitates these barren states uh, in a, in, and makes them more stable over a longer time period by minimizing energetic demand. Um, now, what was uh, kind of an interesting result that I didn't expect was um, that the feeding rate did not um, uh, comport with the metabolic rate, uh, if you will. So, in other words, seeing that big difference in resting metabolism, I expected to see differences in feeding rate um, depending on whether you're at a normal metabolic rate or at a depressed metabolic rate, but I didn't. Um, I saw that uh, regardless of whether you're from the barren or the kelp forest, um, your feeding rate was more or less the same. Um, and so uh, that um, is, is interesting when you think about um, persistent sea urchins in barren landscapes that are able to just immediately feed um, on any available food at a rate con uh, comparable to kelp forest animals without lag time. Um, if you look at um, energy reserves, uh, so in this case, a proxy for that is gonadal biomass, because again, those organs are both uh, energy storage and reproductive organs. 
um, you see kind of a similar uh, uh, two classes of response, you know, the, the A's and the B's. Um, and uh, so this is an indication that in addition to that metabolic dynamic, there's also this uh, uh, mobilization of ener energy reserves from, from the gonads um, over just a month. And so this is a parallel mechanism that's facilitating the barren state uh, over time. Um, if you look at efficiency, um, what, and, and by efficiency I mean um, the conversion efficiency between food and new gonadal biomass, um, you see that the high, higher quality diet, in this case um, kind of a diverse uh, mixed salad of different algae species that have high concentrations of valuable fatty acids, um, you get more efficient growth, pretty, pretty markedly more efficient growth for both habitats' origins. And so this um, has some, you know, pretty compelling aquaculture uh, implications where, you know, uh, diets that are high in PUFAs, um, uh, which this is an example of using naturally occurring mixtures of different species of algae, um, yielded much more efficient uh, product uh, of uh, gonads, which in a fisheries context is uni. Um, and another implication is that, um, you know, you might observe compensatory feeding on poor quality uh, kelp inside of a barren uh, to make up for their metabolic deficits. And that kelp recruits um, are kind of like candy. They're like junk food. Um, and so they're going to eat that. It's a poor quality diet and they're going to eat it uh, uh, faster because there are more of it because um, if you, you can compensate for a poor diet if you just eat a ton of it. Uh, so a second benefit of this experiment is the fatty acid biomarker assimilation dynamics. So a brief primer on fatty acid biomarkers. Um, the theory is based on the principle that you are what you eat. And so um, in this cartoon, you can see uh, primary producers, different species of algae, and primary consumers uh, or herbivores like urchins, abalone. And if you take samples of these uh, organisms, extract the lipids from them, and isolate the fatty acids, um, you can characterize a profile of uh, those different uh, tissue types. And uh, the benefit of this is that um, there, there are, are more, more than one way to look at uh, dietary tracers. A really common one is stable isotopes. Uh, one of the limitations, stable isotopes are great, I should say, um, uh, for studying things uh, between trophic levels, um, but they're limited in the number of end members that they have. You're talking about, uh, you know, usually one to two to at most five different tracers. Uh, but for fatty acids, um, you're talking about a profile with 34 or more uh, per sample. And so, you know, it's like seeing uh, in technicolor for the first time um, uh, within a trophic level. And so it's possible that this might be an uh, approach that's well suited for looking at diet differences within a trophic level, like within herbivores, for example. Um, so if you're looking at fatty acid data, this is what the data, raw data looks like. Um, this is a chromatogram. Uh, each of these peaks represents a different fatty acid. Um, some that you've probably heard of are um, EPA and DHA, these are long chain fatty acids uh, that are nutritionally valuable for a number of reasons. So for example, DHA um, is essential for gametogenesis, uh, gonad growth, and survival in a number of different species, including humans. Um, so it's, uh, you find it in supplements uh, all the time. Um, so one of the challenges with using this approach, though, is um, that in the simple scenario that I wish was the case, um, you would assimilate fatty acids in a one-to-one -one ratio, unchanged. So whatever fatty acids you consume, those get turned into tissue, and it's, uh, it, it's a straightforward uh, conversion. But what's more often the case, unfortunately, is this more complicated dynamic where fatty acids are converted uh, through the biochemistry of the consumer um, into different forms once they uh, achieve new tissue uh, generation which makes it uh, not as straightforward to infer their diet just from their uh, tissue profile alone. 
That's why these feeding trials are really important, uh, is because you can characterize that trophic modification uh, in a controlled setting. Um, so to bring it into a natural history context, uh, throughout British Columbia, this is a very typical temperate reef um, where the benthic productivity differs as a function of depth. Uh, in the shallows, you have this uh, feed line, narrow band of persistent kelp that uh, is protected from sea urchins because of uh, wave exposure or different dynamics. And then it transitions uh, as you go deeper. So in the shallow zone, uh, intertidal, you have fucoids. Uh, in the mid-depth, you have a, a whole assemblage of different species. Uh, and then at uh, deeper depths, it's pretty much dominated by uh, encrusting species, whether it's corallins or um, encrusting browns or biofilms. And if you look at how that translates to um, consumer tissue, you can use sea urchins as a way to look at that. And what you see on the right of this plot uh, is uh, a series of photos taken from urchins uh, at different depths. And so right at the feed line, which is where most commercial uh, harvesters do their fishing, you tend to see these nice um, uni that are you know, r restaurant grade, good quality, appetizing. And as you get deeper, you get these more diminutive, disgusting gonads um, that are uh, pretty visibly depleted. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and not only uh, at that macro scale, but also at the level of uh, fatty acid composition. So what I'm showing here um, in this plot is an NMDS plot. Um, so this is a multivariate plot that uh, will, dis uh, that will uh, illustrate uh, relative differences uh, between uh, individual samples um, in terms of how different or similar they are in a multivariate sense. And so um, just to orient you, the, the yellow um, dots and ellipses are from kelp forests, and the gray uh, dots and ellipses are from the barrens. And what we see is a pretty consistent compositional difference, um, not just the macro scale. Um, and it's um, pretty consistently uh, separated by specific sets of fatty acids. So these are three different locations, and you see a pretty consistent trend across the different locations as far as how these fatty acid compositions differ. And I'm going to get into what those consistencies are in a minute. Um, so this, um, this study raised more food questions um, and also um, uh, uh, related to an application of these insights to restoration ecology. Um, and so uh, the question I was asking in the, 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 the following research that I'm going to show um, is how does kelp recovery affect the nutritional seascape? We care a lot about kelp recovery. We invest a lot of energy and resources into kelp restoration for a lot of reasons. But what we, uh, we don't necessarily know is how the uh, nutritional seascape changes through that process. How do grazers respond to this shift physiologically in terms of performance? And how does um, kelp and grazer resurgence influence local fisheries? Um, and so the approach that I'm going to talk about is using these fatty acids that we've fortunately now calibrated using that feeding trial. Um, so kelp forest restoration has been going on for a long time uh, all over the world. Um, this is a review that came out in 2022 highlighting that the first record of kelp restoration was in Japan in the 1700s, and it's going on uh, today uh, only at a much greater scale. Um, and uh, This is a, a, more, a more recent plot um, illustrating uh, the distribution of kelp restoration efforts globally. And um, you know, there's a lot of exciting research going on. Um, there's, there's some groups working in Australia and New Zealand um, that, are, that are doing um, interesting work on this. Um, but the project that I'm going to focus on for this talk um, is one that I was a part of called Chihu To Inasco, which is Haida for uh, nurturing seafood to grow. Um, and this was based in Haida Gwaii, which is a very special corner of the world. It's incredibly beautiful. Um, and uh, so this was a project that was meant to restore kelp in uh, collaboration with uh, many partners that I'll talk about. And the story of this collaboration is, is published um, in Ecological Restoration, and you can read more about it there. 
Um, so this was a, a partnership between academic researchers, um, commercial fishers, uh, and First Nations uh, divers, and um, government employees, um, uh, all working together uh, towards this common goal um, uh, through with different lenses of um, stakeholder interests. Um, and what we saw was that um, kelp forest restoration uh, seemed to work pretty well. Um, so if you look at the top row, this is the control site, um, and the bottom row is the restoration site. And if you look at um, the difference over time, um, this is the difference of kelp canopy distribution. Um, so it's kind of a macro scale, quick and dirty look at uh, the differences. You see pretty clearly at the restoration site um, a huge resurgence of kelp canopy um, uh, following restoration. So uh, in the summer of 2018, before this restoration intervention, there were almost 50, 50 individuals per 10 meters squared um, of red sea urchins uh, in this uh, region, that's the dominant species. Uh, and post-restoration, uh, there that was uh, that number was reduced uh, almost tenfold, uh, and so it was pretty effective uh, restoration. If you want to put a finer point on it, um, the pre-restoration time point in this plot is the the sections uh, illustrated in gray, and uh, the two panels represent the control site and restoration site, respectively, and. What you see, if you look at a time series of abundance of sea urchins, you can see that after the intervention, um, you get a huge reduction in the density of urchins. Um, so, you know, uh, this, this makes the point that it was effective uh, in, in this case. If you look at the response of the kelp community, the, uh, you can see uh, a, a pretty interesting uh, effect. So at the control site, you can see uh, canopy kelp, oh, wait, I should back up. Um, I'm going to sh the, the three lines um, of this of this plot represent different depths. So we had transects that were very shallow, some that were mid, and some that were deep. And uh, you can see at the control site the kelp was very abundant, particularly in the shallows. Uh, and at the restoration site, interestingly, following um, following recovery uh, or following restoration efforts, um, we saw a huge increase uh, in the abundance of deeper water algae species. Um, so you can notice at both sites the, uh, the canopy species were uh, pretty consistent regardless of the intervention. But what I really want to focus on for this was this deeper water uh, kind of resurgence of the kelp forest. And if you look at um, the, the consumer response in terms of physiology, um, this plot is going to show uh, gon body size specific gonad mass of sea urchins. And what you see um, at the control site is uh, not a lot of difference between 2018 and 2019, which were represented by red and blue, respectively. Uh, but at the restoration site, at the deeper um, depth, uh, which is this 5 to 10 meter depth, we saw a big increase in the uh, body size specific gonad mass, um, which is evidence to suggest that they had much greater food availability at that depth but not so much at the, in the shallows, which was, was, was what you would expect given the persistence of that um, feed line. Um, just a note, I also sampled um, many, many species of algae in those habitats. And what's nice, um, looking at the fatty acid composition, is that they tend to separate pretty distinctly in multivariate space. Um, and so this is uh, some evidence to suggest that these algae um, are uh, distinguishable uh, at least in multivariate context. And um, interestingly, um, specific fatty acids jump out as biomarkers of, of certain taxa. So these two in particular, 18.1 N7, 18.1 N9. Um, these are the two fatty acids I'm going to focus on, um, which were demonstrably indica indicative of kelp in this uh, context. Um, and so if we look at a time series of the composition of the gonads of the sea urchins uh, throughout this process, um, we can see that before the intervention, um, we have uh, these, multivari these are multivariate plots. Again, NMDS uh, plots showing uh, similarities versus differences in fatty acid composition. 
And what you see are persistent differences as a function of depth um, or habitat, barrens versus kelp, um, where you have one set, one group that clusters um, representing barrens or deeper depths, and another group representing kelp or shallower depths. Um, and that was a persistent pattern for both sites. The rows, in this case, are the control and restoration sites. In 2019, the first year after intervention, um, what we saw that was pretty exciting was this uh, transformation uh, in the deeper uh, water at the restoration site where the deeper water composition, uh, that difference that we had before, uh, disappeared um, the year after this intervention, showing that those barren zombie urchins uh, more or less uh, became uh, uh, comparable to kelp forest urchins. Uh, which was pretty exciting from a uh, restoration perspective. At the control site, that, uh, that distinction, though, remained. Um, and the same effect uh, persisted through time. Uh, I should mention that um, this was not a one-time intervention. This was, they went out and did uh, maintenance uh, work to, to maintain the low densities of sea urchins. Um, and so if you look at it um, in terms of what are the drivers of the differences in these um, multivariate compositions, um, that's what this plot gives you. And um, this is um, illustrating that specific sets of fatty acids are driving these differences. Um, so the ones in gold um, tend to represent uh, kelps, and those are, um, are, are indeed what those um, golden uh, clusters uh, are from kelp abundant locations. Uh, and the barren uh, locations are characterized more by these uh, bacterial fatty acids and fatty acids indicative of diatom metabolism, you know, suggesting that there, uh, there is a, m a greater importance of those producers in that context. Um, if we focus on specific uh, subsets of fatty acids, um, what we can see is that at the control site, um, those kelp biomarkers were persistently different as a function of habitat. But at the restoration site, you saw um, it transition from a difference before intervention to no difference after uh, intervention, uh, suggesting this uh, increase in the availability of kelp. Um, if you look at biofilms at the control site, we see a uh, persistent difference as a function of habitat. Um, uh, where you have much higher biofilm bi biomarkers in uh, deeper water barrens and much lower uh, proportions in kelp forest. And the same trend was uh, true at the restoration site before the intervention, but after uh, that difference disappeared. Um, and if you look at uh, the sum total of PUFAs, or polyunsaturated fatty acids, which you hear a lot about a lot in supplements, um, you see a similar dynamic, where at the restoration site, the difference between these two uh, habitats uh, more or less disappeared, um, uh, and, and that indicated that the nutritional quality of the gonads uh, between these two habitats were comparable after the restoration. Um, if we look at a different consumer, um, abalone, I uh, also looked at this one, uh, and abalone were a lot more complicated, and uh, it's still a bit of a head scratcher. They seem to be less responsive um, in this uh, in this context, but there's a lot of really important differences in the physiology, evolutionary history, et cetera, between abalone and, and urchins, uh, not least of which is their movement capacity. Um, so this is kind of still an ongoing work in progress. Um, however, there were similar subsets of fatty acids um, that drove some of the multivariate differences. Again, you have opposing uh, uh, drivers in multivariate space driven by biofilms in the barrens and kelp biomarkers in the kelp forest. Um, and what we did see is that um, in the restoration site, those kelp biomarkers did increase over time uh, in the deeper abalone, um, but it's maybe a little bit slower process than it was for the sea urchins. Um, it's also a different tissue type that was analyzed. so. Um, uh, but another um, very interesting natural history insight that we gained was that there was evidence for an ontogenetic shift where we saw smaller animals have much higher um, proportions of 
biofilm bio biomarkers, and the, that um, switched um, to more uh, kelp biomarkers as they got larger. So as you get bigger abalone, they tended to have a much larger proportion of kelp biomarkers um, as opposed to uh, biofilm biomarkers. So this has uh, at least indirect evidence to suggest that they transition from uh, biofilms when they're small uh, to macroalgae when they're large, uh, and this uh, comports well with some other studies that have used stable isotopes and uh, habitat occupancy uh, as well. And so how does kelp recovery affect the nutritional seascape? Well, it increased valuable fatty acids uh, at deeper waters. How did the grazers respond? Barren gonads grew more similar to kelp forest urchins in both quality and quantity. Urchins and abalone assimilated kelp fatty acids in the deeper water. Um, and we learned that abalone, uh, or we gained more evidence that abalone have this ontogenetic diet shift from biofilm to kelp. Um, what, how does the kelp and grazer resurgence influence local fisheries? Um, well, targeted culling um, might increase the local urchin fishery um, uh, and introduce perhaps deeper refugia for other species like abalone. But I want to emphasize that this is only one of many different um, kelp forest restoration approaches uh, that kind of form a portfolio. So I don't think that this necessarily is a standalone solution, silver bullet, but it could be a valuable component. Okay, pivoting to a different uh, set of drivers. Uh, this next part of the talk, I'm gonna talk just about climatic effects on uh, herbivores and herbivory. And so the title here is going to be Contemporary Ocean Acidification and marine heat waves, and how they shape energetics and rates of herbivory. So, as all of you are aware, um, climate change is a thing. Uh, CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere over time, and that um, correlates with a decline in pH that we uh, describe as ocean acidification. So you have declining pH and uh, increasing partial pressure of CO2 uh, in lockstep with warming. Um, and the biological implications of this are uh, not super bright. Um, future high CO2, um, which is uh, uh, 0.5 pH units less than the global mean surface pH, uh, generally decrease performance of uh, marine organisms. Um, and uh, acidification is likely to continue uh, in the global uh, oceans. Um, however, these corrosive conditions of ocean acidification are notably uh, more dramatic in coastal regions. So a lot of those IPCC projections are based on the, the global oceans on average, or open ocean, um, but they're much more dynamic and uh, much more intense in the, in the coastal uh, region as a function of upwelling. Um, and, you know, again, the global oceans are warming. This is an anomaly uh, time series illustrating that oceans are warming. This is having a, uh, a, an impact on foundational primary producers, algae um, all throughout the world with all kinds of complex responses involving rain shifts, local extinctions, um, uh, and other, uh, other responses. Um, and uh, in addition, um, we have not just this like overall gradual trend in warming, but also these more acute um, uh, press or pulse uh, disturbances like marine heat waves, and those threaten biodiversity and have resulted in biomass loss of many foundation species. Um, I recommend this paper by Dan Smale, our Smalley, um, uh, from 2019 that gets into the details there. Um, and this um, type of disturbance can uh, influence uh, the performance curve of a range of different species uh, in uh, different interesting ways. And so the questions that are going to be driving the rest of the talk are first, how does contemporary high CO2, again, like in this coastal environment, we're talking about, um, we, we are observing uh, high CO2 concentrations that are projected for 50 years in the future for the global oceans, but they're occurring now in the near shore. And then how do the effects of constant thermal regimes um, on performance compare with the effects of dynamic regimes? So, even though it's not always the case that you have constant temperatures, obviously in nature it's much more variable and dynamic. Uh, so just a reminder, um, a thermal performance curve is kind of this 
ubiquitous um, dynamic that occurs uh, is, is a nonlinear response to some stressor uh, and usually temperature, you know. And what happens is as you get warmer, um, your performance, whether it's uh, growth rate, herbivory, movement, uh, metabolism tends to increase uh, rapidly uh, until it reaches some critical threshold, uh, past which it'll drop off a cliff and usually result in mortality. And um, the, the framework that I'm gonna be using conceptually is um, nonlinear differences uh, as, a, as a function of additional stressors on top of the single stressor of temperature in this case, which would offset that nonlinear curve uh, in different ways. And so to test this, um, I got to use this very fancy and complicated and expensive aquarium system at the Hakai Institute in British Columbia, um, which uh, uh, basically had independent control of temperature and PCO2 in a, a whole bunch of mesocosms and uh, implemented this very complex um, experimental design involving um, uh, close to 500 animals where we tested um, uh, constant thermal regimes at um, uh, a, a range of sublethal levels that these animals experience throughout their range crossed with um, elevated CO2 or ambient CO2. And in addition, we had these two treatments um, at ambient temperature, or ambient PoCO2 that were dynamic temperatures that mimicked historical trends rather than maintaining a constant uh, temperature regime. Um, again, measured a lot of stuff. Um, there's a lot of components that are important for an energetic profile, and so we measured metabolic rate by respirometry, we measured per capita consumption using feeding trials, we measured gonadal growth or uh, reproductive potential uh, using dissections. We measured structural growth um, using uh, a tagging technique. And uh, we measured efficiency, both in terms of assimilation, or the ratio of ingestion versus egestion, um, and also uh, conversion efficiency of food into new biomass. So here's what we found. Um, at the end of this three-month long experiment that was uh, a collaborative effort that involved a lot of sweat, blood, and tears, um, we found uh, some pretty interesting results. So if you consider metabolic rate, um, through a lot of the temperature range, metabolic rate is just consistently quite low uh, for b uh, both CO2 levels. Um, but then once you reach about 18 degrees Celsius and beyond, we start to see this exponential increase in resting metabolic rate. And as um, there was an additive offset associated with high CO2 uh, throughout that temperature range. And so this is, was uh, occurring a faster meta metabolic rate under high CO2, which could be some indication of stress um, or added metabolic cost. Um, and this was occurring not just at high temperature, but also um, all the way down at 10 degrees Celsius, which is relevant in an upwelling context. If you look at rates of consumption, um, we see that uh, consumption rate was highly temperature dependent, um, and also PCO2 dependent. So what was pretty dramatic um, was that there was an uh, almost doubling of uh, per capita consumption rate at the same temperature, but at a, at a higher CO2 level. Um, and I should mention this CO2 level is uh, one that was uh, experienced in this region uh, not infrequently, something in the order of uh, 15 to 20% of the year. Um, and so this is a big difference uh, in per capita consumption that if you think about scaling up uh, to a natural population could have a big impact. Uh, if you look at gonadal production, what we saw was this um, unimodal or, or a, 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 a curve, um, a thermal performance curve that was uh, fairly classic um, with very little influence of CO2. Um, so we didn't find a big effect of uh, acidification on uh, gonadal production. However, very interestingly, we saw um, a big reduction in gonadal production uh, for the animals that were exposed to dynamic temperature treatments as opposed to constant treatments. So on one level, this wouldn't be shocking because we know from Jensen's inequality that, um, that you would expect a difference in the, in the mean uh, response uh, as a function of increasing variability. 
Um, but the magnitude and direction of that difference uh, is, uh, requires more knowledge of the biology, not just the mathematics of it. And so this was a pretty big impact. This was from uh, La Nina uh, simulation, if you will, based on a uh, historical temperature trend. And we saw this big difference uh, in uh, gonadal production. Um, and uh, I'll talk about implications of that more in a minute. If you look at food conversion efficiency, the efficiency with which uh, they convert food to new biomass, um, we see that the efficiency is um, uh, much higher um, at low temperatures, but then quite a bit lower uh, in high CO2. Um, and it was more or less constant um, uh, for ambient CO2. So if you look at structural growth, um, uh, which I'm just illustrating here because it's a cool technique where you inject sea urchins with an inert antibiotic uh, and then they glow under UV light. So you get very precise measurements of uh, structural growth. Um, we see uh, not a huge effect of temperature, but a reduction uh, in skeletal growth associated with high CO2, uh, which is kind of what we might expect given that um, calcification is highly uh, CO2 dependent. Um, and so given that the, uh, the jaw structures are uh, calcified, um, I guess it's not much of a surprise here. Um, however, the uh, dynamic El Nino treatment um, was quite a bit lower than the constant treatment, um, at, whereas the, the other dynamic treatment, the La Nina treatment, was not different than the constant treatment. Um, and that's kind of the opposite set of differences from what I showed before on the gonad response. So it's possible that the gonad response and the skeletal response operate through different mechanisms, um, which is interesting. So what is the implications of all of this? Um, well, it's complicated. Um, maybe the barren state will increase in frequency or persistence or both under contemporary warming and more so under high CO2 contexts. The aggravating factors for this, of course, are ocean acidification continuing declines in nutritional quality of available food, which has been noted um, by, uh, uh, by authors at UC Santa Barbara looking at kelp quality. Uh, but there's also mitigating factors where you have increases uh, in primary production as a function of high nutrients and PCO2 during upwelling, which could stimulate algal growth. Um, so this needs more research to tease apart this balance. Um, but then, uh, like I indicated before, thermal performance curves estimated with constant treatments might overestimate reproductive potential, like we saw in that case where there was a big reduction in gonad, produ in gonad uh, production uh, between the constant 16 degrees and the dynamic uh, La Nina that shared the same mean temperature. Um, I wanted to highlight that just last week, um, two papers came out in Nature Eco Evo on a different uh, set of species entirely um, uh, that are, that are uh, focused on um, the vulnerability of a different foundational species, seagrass, uh, to uh, tropicalization-induced herbivory. Um, so, you know, there's, there's uh, th these imp sublethal impacts on herbivores are likely having big consequences all over the world. Um, future directions. Uh, so this is where I get to plug my um, uh, NSF postdoc fellowship that's starting March 1st. Um, and this is where I'm going to be trying to explore uh, some more of this uh, climatic uh, driver impacts. Um, through a set of laboratory experiments, uh, field experiments, and modeling. And if you're interested in learning more about that, please uh, come talk to me at any point, or you can email me. Um, you might have noticed on all these slides, um, I have put my email right there and my website. I just launched a website for the first time, um, and so it has more information on there. So with that, um, I would love to have questions. really interesting. I have a question that uh, I've had for a long time about gonadal indices. You, you showed a bunch of different things that affect gonadal 
indices, the quality and production. And um, temperature, diverse food resources. And my question is about the next population of urchins. And have you found, or have people looked at the effect of the next generation? So like the fertility rates and stuff, and how that bodes for the upcoming populations of urchins? That's a very good question. Um, in a nutshell, I haven't done it, but um, my advisor, Dan Okamoto's lab, has been actively working on that question. So um, the, the experiment that I described where we manipulated temperature and CO2, um, at the end of that experiment, we then spawned all those adults and tracked the performance of the larvae all the way through um, uh, early settlement. Um, and so uh, at, at least uh, to the level of early settlement, we have data on um, morphological differences, differences in the time to settlement, um, differences in mortality of the larvae, and their um, uh, correlation with different uh, genomic and transcriptomic drivers. Um, so that is, that information is forthcoming, but it's not available now. Um, I just think from a, you know, to your point, a human uh, context that's pretty interesting is, is considering um, DNA methylation epigenetic effects associated with starved mothers during famines and how that translates to poor performance in, in, in the children, uh, in their babies, in the next generation. And they tend to have this metabolic syndrome where they're kind of primed to, to uh, store fat and have all kinds of problems with things like di diabetes um, later in life because they're primed for a life of starvation, kind of, so. Thank you so much. I have so many questions, but uh, I think one, the, the, the last question I came up with, the best one I can remember, was from the, the experiments you did with the dynamic and the static OA conditions and temperature trials. And I was wondering, did, were, there, were there, do you think that urchins will acclimate to those conditions? Did you have any sort of temporal component to the sampling? And with that, like I, I always wonder what's a stress response and what's sort of a, the physiological function that you're looking for in those experiments? Um, that is, I think, an ongoing challenge, whether it's acclimation or acclimatization. Um, and one uh, bit of insight that we got was through repeated measures of metabolic rate and feeding. Um, we didn't see big differences in feeding, but we did see differences in metabolic rate through time. So this was a three-month-long experiment. Um, each individual animal had a pit tag. Um, so we were able to take repeated measures of respiration on animals and know which individual we were actually measuring. And what you saw is like for the first month, um, there was like relatively high metabolic rate in the stressful conditions, but that the, over time points two, three, and four, um, that that uh, equilibrated to uh, a flat uh, uh, persistent level. So I think at le you know we have some evidence to suggest that that was uh, a, at least a persistent plastic change. I have a question. This is just a logistical question, but it affects, you, you mentioned at the beginning of your experiment that we, this is how we designated a urchin from a barren, and this is one from a kelp forest. And you, ha you gave some measurement of like 25 meters away from the nearest kelp. So uh, I just wondered how you came up with that because certainly drift from a nearby kelp, for kelp can drift in and probably affect you know, the metabolic out backdrop that you're starting from. And um, I just wondered how you came up with that. And then were there any other students in here that are interested in projects that you, you, know, you might have, if you could just speak a little more on what you're looking for first question, how did we choose sites and depth profiles? Um, it was, we wanted to examine differences in natural food availability without confounding it by looking at big, dif big ge geographic differences. So what's convenient about this 
region is that you have relatively steep um, profiles, and so you get like a real big change in habitat type over a short, uh, planar distance. And so that's why we did that. Um, and then to your second question, uh, this project uh, the, that I'll go back, yeah, this one. Um, so uh, this project will involve um, mesocosm experiments. So if you're interested in running uh, mesocosm work, looking at um, something in the ballpark of what I've been describing, um, I am really interested in someone, uh, you know, collaborating together um, and carving out a chunk of it for their own independent research. But then also for working in the field, I want to go out and tag animals in high upwelling and low upwelling sites to get more time integrated responses. Um, so if there's any divers um, or people that are interested in getting out in the field and doing some surveys and tagging uh, and collections, um, I could use help with that as well. Um, there's a uh, molecular component to this. So if you're interested in looking at differential gene expression um, or uh, the microbiome, those are um, also layers that I could use help with um, or uh, would love collaborative uh, input. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank you.